Sure, all right. Good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you for coming to this monthly edition of the PHJV webinar series. As many of you know, my name is John Patterson Williams, and I'm the coordinator of the PHJV's policy committee. And it's a real yeah, pleasure to have you all here again for what looks like will be a good, uh, good lecture by Dr. Vic Adamovich. I think Vic has his reputation precedes him. I do believe uh, he's perhaps he's been around a while. Um, Vic is a professor of environmental economics in the Department of Resource Economics, Environmental Sociology at uh, the University of Alberta, and he's been the vice dean of the Faculty of Agriculture, Life and Environmental Science at the University of Alberta for the last, I think, five, five years. And I'll let him explain a little more. Uh, Vic and I, he was also my master's supervisor, so we have a long relationship and friendship. So really appreciate his time today and in particular on a very timely uh, subject. And so uh, without further ado, Vic. Great, thanks, John. Uh, I think I've unmuted my microphone. You can hear me OK? Yes, sounds good. Great. Well, thanks for the invitation. I, I think John just called me old, but in a very polite way. So that's a uh, very kind of you, John. Experience, perhaps. Uh, happy Valentine's Day, everybody. It's an, uh, an interesting way to spend Valentine's talking about natural climate solutions, but uh, I hope I hope it's interesting. Uh, I got a, a few things to say before we get really rolling in here, and I'm I'm aiming to have this more of hopefully more of a discussion than a than a one way lecture, but. Uh, if I, as long as I can stop talking fast enough. Uh, let, let me start off by saying uh, here, I'm at the University of Alberta and we are on Treaty 6 territory and also in the, the homeland of the Métis. Uh, we have a, a sort of standard land acknowledgement that we use, uh, but yesterday, and I'm gonna actually encourage you to go look at something else. Yesterday, as part of our Bentley lecture, our, our annual lecture, which is on also Agriculture Day, uh, Dr. Melissa Arcan from the University of Saskatchewan gave just a wonderful presentation on soil health and Indigenous people and Indigenous perspectives on soil health. It was fascinating. I learned a ton. Um, it's on our faculty YouTube channel, so you could go and search search it or send me an email if you want to look for the link. But just the the connection to the land and the perspective on on land and climate and soil health was uh, was really fascinating and wonderful. So. I would I would encourage you to view that and likely more interesting than what I'm going to talk about today. Um, John uh, asked me to ask me to speak on this topic. Uh, I'm uh, a bit hesitant, having a bit of imposter syndrome here because I'm not going to share any fascinating brand new research results, but I'm going to reflect on a few things that I've experienced. I also found out I'll just turn my camera off in case that's causing any bandwidth issues. I found out that John's giving a talk similar to this on some pretty closely related topics tomorrow uh, here on campus. So you're welcome to come and visit that for those who are in the vicinity. You might get some firsthand experience and some new things that John's doing. So here's what I'm going to talk about this natural climate solutions uh, and co-benefits, because I think co-benefits is something that comes up a lot. A um, little bit about my perspectives on measurement, prospects, pitfalls, research opportunities. So broad overview, just to make sure we're all in the same playing field or level playing field, we'll talk a little bit about what natural climate solutions are. There's lots of different definitions. One thing that I'm going to do perhaps a, that's a bit different than others is I'm an economist, so I'm going to focus on economic aspects that may not be everybody's favorite flavor, uh, but I think it's a, a one perspective and maybe a perspective that um, we could look at and see if there are some some useful tools within the economics profession that may help us. A little bit about advantages or, and co-benefits and concerns, and then I'm going to switch to the co-benefits topic and we can uh, discuss some of those issues. Now, where am I coming from on this? Um, I had the great fortune and a, and a real honor to be part of the, the panel, the Council of Canadian Academies panel on nature-based climate solutions or natural climate solutions. We wrapped up at the end of 2022. We had presentations through parts of 2023. Um, this was just such a wonderful experience for me. And you can see the list of people who were on that particular panel, uh, reviewing the literature, 
putting together some synthesis material. Uh, of course, that's all available publicly. Um, and, uh, there are new things that have come out, and I'll maybe touch on a couple of those things from an economic perspective that may be useful. Um, I'm I'm going to make comments about this report and others from my perspective. So I'm not speaking on behalf of anybody on the, on the panel. This is really just my take, but I'm, I've really benefited from the experience of, of being together with these colleagues online and in person to learn about this issue. And I, I think this is such an, an important interdisciplinary issue that it was really great to see a panel like this with such diverse disciplinary backgrounds and geographic backgrounds come together. So with that, let me start off with what am I thinking about? So what did we we call the, the natural climate solutions in the Council Canadian Academies report? Protection management restoration. I've highlighted a few words. Additional climate change mitigation. So that's one of the key things that we'll come back to is that this is an approach that does something additional to what one would normally do. It's somewhat controversial, but of course, to, to assess additional, we need to know something about a baseline and that some of those different initiatives may mitigate climate uh, challenges, but they also have potentially co-benefits. Um, other reports define things differently. Uh, I'll touch on a couple of these throughout the talk. Uh, the Roe et al. really described it broadly as land-based measures to mitigate climate change. Um, they included things that were a broader list than what CCA had in their report. Interestingly, they also had what they called demand measures. So initiatives that would reduce pressure on a land base, whether it's uh, pressure for certain agricultural practices or for forest practices that might change the carbon baseline. So that was, uh, that was a bit of an extension and I think an interesting one, difficult to model. Uh, Trevor et al. was really a tour de force on the Canadian scene of uh, how to assess natural climate solutions. And I really like the quote out of theirs. Uh, Unlike other carbon capture technologies, natural climate solutions are scalable and deployable now and may provide co-benefits beyond climate mitigation. I think that's a very nice summary. There are broader reports on uh, Carbon dioxide removal is a fascinating, the state of carbon dioxide removal publication out of the United States, where they they would put land and water based uh, initiatives into what they call conventional uh, carbon dioxide removal mechanisms versus non-conventional direct air capture, et cetera. So they do a much broader assessment that includes things beyond what we would think of as natural climate, and they compare those with other innovative approaches. What's included? I don't think this is a surprise for most folks on this call. Various ways to address forest cover, forest growth, reforestation, avoided deforestation on the agricultural side, a host of different management strategies. Um, certain certain studies included enteric fermentation. That was not one of the parts of the Council of Canadian Academies report, but, but Roe et al. certainly had that as part of their strategies. Uh, wetlands, peatlands, which I think would be a focus for many folks on this call, and things like demand management, um, reducing reducing fuel wood extraction, reducing food waste as mechanisms to put less pressure on the land base, if you will, and address carbon that way. Why? I like this uh, image from Grissom et al. And uh, it's, a, it's a bit older now, but I think it really captures it. Is uh, natural climate solutions are a known technology. We uh, There's always uncertainty and there are concerns about the uncertainty, but there are lots of things that we know because we've been studying these things from biological and economic perspectives for a long time. They may be cost effective. We'll talk about that. Um, there may be potential goal benefits. And of course, we need everything on the table. We're going to be looking at ways to address climate change. Let's see what options are out there and examine the best options with, with particular detail. And this little graphic that they have is just showing that natural climate solutions is one of the mechanisms that uh, one could employ, and it could be potentially a significant mechanism to try to address climate change or greenhouse gas emissions. This is, I know the text is a little small here, but on the left-hand side is one of the tables from the CCA report. On the right-hand side is something from the state of carbon dioxide removal. And to me, it's just a way to emphasize why natural climate solutions, just from a purely economic or cost perspective. If we look at, this is a forestry set of examples. CCA, we've got things in the 57, $90 per ton of carbon, 
96 dollars in 2050 uh, those are relatively low if you compare them to the cost at scale of direct air capture uh, ocean fertilization a host of other techniques that are up in the three four five hundred dollar range um, and that right hand side one is actually in us dollars so I think from a cost perspective, it's certainly worth thinking carefully about natural climate solutions. How much can get done? Uh, most of the studies examine technical potential, uh, and I'll talk about a couple of them in a minute. Almost all of them used some type of threshold for what you might consider feasible or economically feasible uh, natural climate solutions. And I think this is one of the things that I'd like to spend a couple of minutes on. Uh, most studies use $100 a ton CO2 equivalent. So if if the particular approach is more than $100 per ton, uh, viewed as perhaps not as economically feasible, that there are other approaches, perhaps outside the natural cl climate solution sphere, that would be helpful. Is that the right value to use? And I think we're changing our thoughts on what that number should be. Um, are they temporary or permanent? And that's always a concern. If they are temporary, how do we factor them in? Do we think about rental of uh, climate mitigation? Uh, how do we value those? The related issues are on the uncertainty of the sequestration or the risk of release, and then the timing. By when should we try to? How much should we? Uh, can we accumulate by 2030 or by 2050? So this is a quick summary of those uh, three reports that I summarized. Um, Council Canadian Academies is, a, uh, well, first of all, sort of admission target is around 670, you know, somewhere between that and 700, depending on which of the latest numbers you pull out. Um, I think that one's from 2022 that's in the footnote. So CCA was saying about 6% of current annual, annual emissions. Um, that's relatively conservative uh, or smaller number. Drever was saying about twice that, so significantly more. Roetal is much higher, 60% uh, of current emissions. So depending on the methodology and the assumptions involved and the assumptions around the economic feasibility, uh, we see different outcomes. Uh, and of course, on the CCA side, the most promising outcomes were, things were most, mostly in the agricultural sphere, crop management, soil management, some in the forest side, forest restoration and improved forest management. So. It's not going to be the only answer. Uh, there are other measures that would have to be taken to try to address greenhouse gas emissions. It could be a, a significant and a low cost approach, um, but other things are going to have to be done to address questions of greenhouse gas emissions. Just to highlight a couple of reasons why we didn't see things like wetlands or peatlands within those uh, sort of top, uh, top approaches. Avoided conversion of peatland is the greatest mitigation potential. So in terms of mitigation potential, it's significant, but it faces an economic barrier. And that's the one that I want to go back and talk a little bit about. I think we can uh, perhaps think about what that means and what some of the ways of measuring or perhaps changing that might be. And just issues around uncertainty, restored mineral wetlands subject to uncertainties, um, other methane emissions, et cetera. So there are questions around uh, how secure these investments might be in uh, climate mitigation. I want to go back to this question, $100 a ton. And as I say, this is, this is a number that gets used in a number of different studies around the world. It's kind of a benchmark. Um, where does it come from? Um, what's it, what are we thinking about? I, I think most folks, immediate thought is, well, let's go talk, compare it to the carbon tax. There's the Canadian carbon tax per year. Uh, lots of controversy about the carbon tax. Um, this is actually not the right thing in a sense to compare it to. It provides a bit of information as to what the signal um, is being sent to consumers or emitters of carbon about the uh, the amount that they would pay. What we probably should be thinking about is what's called the social cost of greenhouse gas emissions. This is relatively new. Sorry, I should have put the date in this. This is a uh, 2023 publication, I believe, on an attempt to measure what the cost to society is of an emission of a ton of carbon or CO2 equivalent. And very technical derivations and such. 
but this is the latest set of measures uh, in 2021 dollars for Canada, uh, much higher than what the current carbon tax is and increasing through time. So that's the measurement of the social cost of an emission of a ton of carbon in those particular years. Now that would be, a, and methane and other emissions are included there with the appropriate global warming potential factored in. So this is a, a, an interesting calculation. Uh, this is really paralleling a process that has gone on in the United States and that has now been uh, finalized in the US. I should say a quick aside, this is uh, uh, just uh, non-commercial non advertising for society that uh, I'm actually heavily involved in, the Society for Benefit Cost Analysis. At this very moment, almost, they are having a workshop on understanding social cost of greenhouse gas emission estimates put on by the US EPA. This is a uh, significant policy initiative or policy lever to use social costs of carbon as a guide for benefit cost analysis of projects on the environmental sphere or any type of project that results in greenhouse gas emissions or reductions in greenhouse gases through sequestration. So you can join in the last day of that if you're really interested. But just to provide a comparison, this is the US EPA's report that is now finalized on what the social cost of carbon is. And we see those numbers are quite a bit bigger than the $100 a ton number. Um, so maybe in the back of our minds, we should be thinking that $100 a ton is perhaps a bit conservative. And I think we, we have to start worrying about this linkage with the social cost of carbon literature because this is now becoming uh, an element in policy analysis for economy-wide assessments of emissions or uh, sequestration. Now, that's kind of one message that I think it's worth us thinking about, uh, not only as economists, but also as individuals interested in cost-effective environmental actions. This number is not without controversy, and the way it's calculated is uh, fascinating. Multiple groups doing things in different ways. I'm going to show you one image uh, in a second. It's a bit of a jarring image, but it's one that just reminds me of where some of these uh, cost calculations of what the impact of climate change are. There's really four categories or so that the social cost of carbon is measured on. It's measured on the impacts on health and mortality associated with climate change through into the future, impacts on labor productivity, impacts on sea level rise, and for example, property values and impacts on agricultural productivity. Now, one thing to note, those are all captured through market mechanisms. Um, a lot of our environmental goods and services are not yet captured in this. And so that's actually one of the challenges associated with social cost of carbon. It may actually be an underestimate, but it's also measuring things on a global scale. And this is the, this is the jarring image. This is actually one of the pieces that feeds in, in some cases, into the social cost of carbon calculation. This is the mortality effect associated with climate change. And there's two notable things from this. First of all, it's adverse that uh, temperatures will rise and there will be impacts on human population through health, but it's also very unequally distributed across the, across the globe. And that's just a, another reminder for us when we're thinking about investments in climate change solutions that they're, they also have equity aspects and distributional aspects. And I'll come back to that a little bit later in the talk, because again, I think that's something in a future research set of initiatives, we should have that in the back of our minds is thinking about what are the equity impacts or the distributional impacts of mitigation measures or actions that we take, and whether that's reducing climate change or investing in environmental solutions. Okay, let me just go back to the Council of Canadian Academies report again, just to summarize a couple of measures we have. In this case, this is uh, freshwater aquatic systems. You can see avoided conversion of peatlands is a significant number under the CCA report in terms of potential. So that's why it looks like a very, very strong option. Uh, challenge is, is that the costs, as were highlighted in that box previously, the costs per ton are, are fairly high and perhaps even higher than some of those social cost of carbon estimates, certainly higher than the $100 a ton that's commonly used. So there's some of the concern. This is just a, a snippet of some of the ways to characterize the programs from that report, lower risk, lower reward. We can see some of the, the well-known solutions around grassland management, forest management. On the right-hand side, lower potential, 
uh, peatland restoration. So they're perhaps not as much in terms of potential sequestration, but potentially useful options down the road. What are the challenges? Well, I, there's a long shopping list here, and I don't want to go through the, the whole shopping list. Uh, one that is always on economists' minds, and I know others, is are these actions actually additional? Are they sequestering additional carbon than would have done under normal or baseline conditions or business as usual conditions? And this is particularly concerned in avoided conversion approaches is that if we're measuring avoided conversion, is it something that wouldn't have been converted anyway? And again, I know that's controversial, and I'll go through a couple of these other options in a minute. But just to touch base on some recent work that we're seeing, not so much in Canada, but in the global initiatives around avoided conversion or avoided deforestation, there's just a great deal of concern. Uh, last March came out a series of reports on concerns about carbon credits, particularly with uh, red plus in, in the global south and avoided deforestation. The measurements initially were suggesting significant carbon sequestration. The scientific analysis saying that there actually looks like there's relatively little sequestration that came out of those schemes. There are some exceptions, but some real concerns about how exactly those programs are implemented and verified. And that's you know, in addition to potentially high costs, that's one of the concerns with avoided uh, avoided conversion or avoided deforestation. This is work by West et al. Um, I've got this in the references later on. I just highlight one from their work. These are published in some of the top journals. Our findings show that most projects have not reduced deforestation, even though the expectation was that there would be significant deforestation reduction and that there would be carbon sequestration associated with it. So it comes back to the implementation side or some of the concerns around how these schemes are designed, even when they have potential. OK, let me go back to my list. I've got kind of the standard ones. Um, we worry about the lack of permanence of some of these. Uh, we can maybe account for that with some of the monitoring. There's uncertainty around what the baseline is, what the change is. We always worry about monitoring. The transactions cost is significant in these cases. Again, that's maybe more on the minds of economists, but uh, designing schemes, uh, identifying how to implement those schemes, providing compensation if there's compensation required for land use practices that are being changed. Those mechanisms have to be sorted out. I think those are all challenges. Um, an indigenous community approach is a really should put that in as an opportunity. And again, you know, thinking about the the, the presentation by Dr. Arcan yesterday is just there. There may be some really significant ways to think about conservation and, and climate mitigation from Indigenous community approaches and perspectives. And just to bring back on the table, to, again, let's keep thinking about the distributional consequences of these different schemes. I've got three at the bottom that I've, I've highlighted, and it's a bit jargony, but the real options aspects. One concern that I haven't really seen it spelled out clearly um, in, the, in the Canadian context, you know, we've seen land prices increases and increasing over time and in a climate change world one of the possibilities is that Canada will be increasingly uh, relied upon and favorably viewed in terms of agricultural output well that will put pressure on conservation mechanisms possibly whether it's agriculture or forestry land and we have to start thinking about what the implications of future demands might be uh, there may be delays in thinking of conservation options because people want to leave open the opportunity for future economic gains. So this sort of dynamic approach to thinking about climate mitigation and, and natural climate solutions, I think, is something we should worry about. Implementation policy design cost effectiveness, that was not part of the CCA mandate, but I think that's just an ongoing set of experiments or issues. And I know many people are experimenting with the Living Labs programs and others, and I think that's super valuable. But let me talk a little bit about co-benefits. And that's something that comes up a lot. It's something that uh, nearly every report mentions them. It may be a way to describe uh, natural climate solutions that perhaps are expensive in terms of pure carbon sequestration, but would be quite a good investment if one could calculate the benefits from other aspects, biodiversity, uh, flood protection, other mechanisms. 
Now, I don't have any answers here, but I've got a couple of examples of things that we might think about in a Canadian context and a couple of concepts to think about if we went down this road. I think we can measure them, and I'll talk a little bit about what they are. I uh, can't measure them perfectly. Whether we can measure them in my favorite units monetary terms, not sure. If we can, that'll be a bonus because we can actually then compare them to those social cost of carbon estimates. Will they always be positive? Um, no. It's, it's not always the case that a natural climate mitigation strategy will generate positive other benefits. Or they might have co-costs cool rather than the co-benefits cool depending on the location, depending on the initiative. And there's some old work that's already shown that. But every report mentions it, and here's one from the CCA report. What am I talking about? Now, water quality improvements, water quantity improvements in some cases, flood risk reductions, biodiversity. These are from the various sources in the literature. Air quality potentially reducing zoonotic disease. So a wide range of things that investments in natural climate or natural cap capital could provide and things that we could add to that value to try to see how it then compares to that social cost of carbon. What are the challenges? Sorry, let me back up here. Yes, I think I've got everything on that list. Challenges, at least for me, from an economic perspective, perspective we're really going to think about measuring the value. We need to identify the impact. So here's a natural climate solution. It's sequestering some carbon and it actually is also improving one of the environmental outcomes that we're interested in. And then we're going to think about how we could create monetary values for those assessments. Not perfect, but it would be one way of measuring these kinds of outcomes. I want to put a couple of key things in the back of everyone's mind. These values are spatially explicit. So they're going to depend on location. And that means whatever we're doing in terms of analysis also has to think about things in terms of space. And it's just like real estate, location matters. And so the value of these initiatives, just like the values associated with most environmental outcomes is going to depend on where those are experienced. This is also really highly interdisciplinary. Um, so it's going to need teams of folks and teams of folks from a wide range of perspectives. Let me give you two examples, and these are a couple things out of the literature that, that I look at, and they might be ways that could perhaps motivate folks across the country to start putting something similar together. The first one I want to talk about is flood risk reduction. So again, imagine that you're investing in wetland restoration or investing in, in avoiding wetland loss. Would there be a co-benefit associated with flood risk reduction? Uh, Taylor and Drunken Miller look at things from the U.S. Uh, this is a paper in the American Economic Review. Uh, this is one of the top journals in economics in the world. So this is uh, very prestigious to have this kind of work and to have wetlands featured. Let me pull a couple things out of the abstract. Average hectare of wetland lost costs society $1,800 annually and over $8,000 in developed areas. So two things, numbers fairly lost, large, uh, and it depends where. In developed areas, it's significantly higher. So these are, again, these are not perfect measures, but these are measures of how claims, insurance claims, would be reduced with maintenance or restoration of wetlands. Now, the next image just shows the importance of space. That It's not true everywhere. These uh, are payback periods. So the green dots, if you like, are very fast payback periods that if you restore uh, a wetland in a particular region, it would return benefits within three, four, five years. Some places it would take much longer to return those benefits of flood risk reduction, but this is one environmental benefit that could be captured through a natural climate solution. And one way to perhaps assess where you would get the best location to invest in you can see the spatial heterogeneity is quite significant in this context. So there's an example, again, not perfect and takes an incredible effort, but given tools that are available, it's possible to do this kind of work. Biodiversity always comes up as one of the co-benefits, if you will. And as economists, we tend to scratch our heads. What is it that's actually generating the value from biodiversity? What is it that People 
people like to have biodiversity, but what are they thinking about? Is it there's improved water quality that may mean better fish populations? Is it wildlife health and they they have preferences for species diversity, protection of a threatened species, habitat quality? Um, I like I like this image on the right hand side. This is from eBird. This is a uh, you can go on the eBird website. My wife's a birder, so I get all kinds of interesting eBird insights. Uh, you can go on there and you can see where people are, where they're identifying at any time of day and where the hotspots are as people are reporting what they're seeing. But these are, in a sense, this is a real time connection between biodiversity, bird diversity and activity and what people like people out there enjoying and active in these cases. So trying to untangle biodiversity and reframe it as what are people thinking about in terms of benefits, I think that's one of the tasks that environmental economists are trying to take on. Again, as an example, this is a relatively recent work, uh, Kristen Vossler and colleagues, there was actually a special issue of the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences on valuing water quality improvements. And I thought for this audience around wetland, wetland restoration, water quality, uh, this might be a, an interesting one. They again, uh, these were largely funded by a, a grant program through the US EPA, where they were very interested in identifying the benefits uh, to citizens of the United States of water quality improvements across the US. Now, a couple of images that I've put on here, these are the values, the economic or monetary values associated with specific. Uh, biological condition gradient in improvements. So that's their measure of biodiversity and the benefits that are coming out of it. Very interdisciplinary team, very interdisciplinary work that's gone on here. And they're highlighting what those monetary values would be. And you see that they're also quite different across space. On the left-hand side, we see some smaller ones, the yellow areas, we see some, some larger ones in the darker areas. And that's across that particular watershed that they've mapped. On the right hand side, I think this is also an important point. If they improved the biodiversity levels in a single watershed that's highlighted by the white line, where do those benefits accrue? Well, they accrue close to where that biodiversity improvement occurs. So there's a kind of decay in the value associated with that. It's mostly around where the improvement occurs and dissipates as you move further away. And so this gives us a way to think about comparing different locations for investments in natural climate solutions, the climate change benefits associated with carbon sequestration, and the potentially additional biodiversity benefits associated with water quality improvements. So I think these are just two examples of the type of work that could be done. We have many examples in Canada of localized work. I think uh, as a sort of long term and and maybe I'm naive and hoping that this would come out. I think if we had national initiatives to try to do some of this work like the US EPA did, I think we would yield really interesting results. All right, let me move towards the last couple of things and then we'll hopefully have some good discussion. I think there are real research opportunities here in terms of uh, trying to assess these co-benefits and measuring them in concert with uh, natural climate solutions. Ideally, we'd link to what those natural climate solution proposals are and think about them as co-benefits, work in interdisciplinary teams. I really caution against using per hectare averages. We saw those maps and we saw the, the heterogeneity across space of what those values are. And I think this the state of the art has really changed over the last decade, um, partly with the advent of tools and spatial analysis, but also the interdisciplinary work that's going on and really the blurring of boundaries between economists and biologists on uh, these types of issues. Again, I want to put it back in the back of our minds. One of the things, if we could calculate these, these benefits over space, and perhaps over groups in society, we could examine the distributional impacts. Um, this aligns with the literature on environmental justice that I think is of increasing importance and of interest. Our students are very interested in environmental justice questions as well as environmental values and environmental economics. And I think this also provides us with the way to have conversations with indigenous people and indigenous communities around management for natural climate solutions. So not only the spatial analysis and adding on to, to climate solutions, 
but challenging environmental economists to think about the distributional impacts of the initiatives that are undertaken. Okay, last couple slides. Um, I think natural climate solutions are, are really interesting. They're uh, potentially significant in magnitude, uh, could be very cost effective as a way to achieve climate change goals. I, I have one other caveat is that almost all of the reports, whether it's CCA or Roe or others, are reporting average numbers of hectares that are cost effective or average cost. There are always going to be areas where there would be significant benefits to investing in those areas with a strategy for natural climate solutions. Finding those, developing mechanisms to find those low cost areas and strategies, I think is also an, an important task. There are lots of uncertainties, lots of work around implementation. Where some potential future work, and I think much of this is already going on, I think the design of these implementation schemes and policy evaluation is really critical. How can we develop mechanisms that are going to be cost effective that will address some of the uncertainties? Um, I've already talked a bunch about the measure of co-benefits, and, and I know I focus on dollars and monetary terms, but it provides a useful measuring stick. Um, it also provides us with a, a way to compare across space, but it's a one tool out of many. I'd really like us to think of natural climate solutions as experiments. These are experiments that we can then evaluate the outcomes, the outcomes in terms of uh, environmental values in general, flood control, biodiversity, recreation improvements, but experiments overall that we can evaluate down the road and then see how well we've done. And it helps us evaluate these distributional impacts and impacts on marginalized populations, which is again another tenant of environmental policy that's getting increasing attention. I've uh, mentioned to the organizers that I do have a list of references. It's up there, it's not complete. I've been a little lazy the last few days, I haven't added the last couple of them. I think they're all in the slides, but if there's anything missing, uh, feel free to send me an email. I'm pretty easy to find, uh, and I will send you whatever that reference happens to be or, or update the slide deck. And at that point, I am going to stop. And I think I've hit my mark at about 22. And I will stop sharing and see if there are comments or questions. Great. Well, thank you very much, Vic. And uh, very efficient use of time and informative session. And we'll forgive you your, your laziness for that lot, upgrading that reference list. So <laughs> uh, no, no. Um, we want to open the floor to some questions here now, and I know normally I would start it off with something to sort of lubricate the process, but Vic and I have lots of time to chat about things, so <laughs> probably too much. So why don't we open it up? I did see a question from Glenn Friesen in Manitoba about, uh, and Glenn, why don't you, you share, and then Catherine Pierce, I have you next. You there, Glenn? There we go. Uh, in here, can you? I'm not sure. Oh, my camera's in the wrong. Okay, hang on. I'll ask my question and show myself after. But uh, uh, great presentation. Thank you so much for this. Um, insightful. I just had a question on the initial number you showed on one of the earlier slides, 670 tons. What when you think about, you know, the responsibility of agriculture? Is that was that just from what what part of the ag sector is that from, or as, as or is that all of all, you know, Canadian emissions, et cetera. And uh, I have a follow up after that, so go ahead. Great, thanks, Glenn. So so that's that's the uh, official Canadian estimate that's published on the federal government website of those uh, under the carbon accounting rules, what's reported as greenhouse gas emissions. So that's out of all the, you know, energy sectors, transportation, uh, build, building emissions, agriculture, et cetera, is aggregated in there. So that reference is in the report and you can, you can pull up what that, 670 to 700 and and the time series is listed in there as well so that i i think i got it right plucked off the number from the the latest report i could find okay. so that's that's where that that's where that sort of total emissions come and of course what are we looking for we're looking for ways to reduce those or to you know sequester some of those to turn to bend the curve on that and that's where those six percent twelve percent numbers were coming from the various reports is that natural climate solutions could soak up uh, annually somewhere in that 40 million metric tons or other numbers. 
it's interesting to see it does very much so and it's it gives perspective on the, the, the what the six percent means as a whole as a Canadian whole but also the I think you know the 40 or 60 percent of red as a third option that's quite significant and uh, can really energize a conversation in the ag sector um yeah as a as a follow-up I just want to ask one more uh um what is the what is the body of science or uh, and or technology sort of indicating or or landing on monitoring biodiversity in some way and maybe not necessarily real time but outside of economists like yourself to doing great work and re and rely on that kind of modeling but is there is there efforts towards or do you see anything moving in the, in the direction of using latest digital technology for monitoring this kind of capacity and, and what that might look like do you mean from a human perspective because that that's sort of my daily wicker i mean on the biological side i see all kinds of amazing innovations but that that's uh, that's outside my lane as as an economist i mean on the human side there is increasing interesting use of uh i mean i showed ebird there are all kinds of papers being written about uh using citizen science database like ebird to say these are if you, if you enhance biodiversity you see more people going to those places you see the economic activity and the value of those sites um, there are other types of uh, digital data tools that are being used. Uh, cell phone pings have been proposed and are used by some researchers to identify changes and responses to fish quality, things like that. So innovative ways to try to identify how people are responding to environmental improvements. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you, Glenn, and thanks, Vic, for those answers. Uh, Catherine, I believe you had your hand up. I did. Thank you. Um, Vic, that was a great presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, I Glenn actually asked a very similar question, so I, I feel like you've answered it. It was the same slide um, and adding some clarification to that was good. I know um, as part of the WPACs, the Watershed Planning and Advisory Councils in Alberta, um, it's important to us to find a way to show some of these kinds of measurements and uh, include that in a, uh, we each have our own segment across our 11 W uh, watersheds um, and we're looking for ways in which to represent uh, data like this at a at a provincial level. Have you seen it done um, across, uh, I don't know, a state or or in in our in a provincial setting where it's used to map that that this kind of data is used? Well, there are examples at examples at sort of smaller scales where people have done you know specific studies in specific regions. I mean, John's done some of that work even even way back when. Um, those two examples that I showed out of the out of the U.S. they're they're sort of data data rich, but they I think there are uh, something to aim for that uh, you know the the, the flood risk reduction uh, tangible benefit that that people certainly talk about. Now that's quite a data compilation to pull that off, um, but that's something that I think would be potentially useful. And then those US EPA studies, there's five of them that are listed in that proceedings of National Academy of Science, and they range from uh, regional examples of how to assess the benefits of water quality improvements to these much broader national types of assessments um, that they've invested in. So I, I think that's, you know, again, that's kind of back to where we, would there be a benefit from investing in a research initiative that really looks at a much bigger landscape, provincial landscape, national landscape, to try to move down this way? And what would it take? And uh, I'd love to see that. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, Sam, Samantha Song, would you like to, to speak um, your question or shall I read it? If you want more an interactive experience, then feel free. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, go as, ahead. as you wish. Fine. No, uh, sorry. Okay, multitasking, but uh, and waiting for my question to come up. But I'm just curious, um, Vic, you know, like in terms of you know where we prioritize. And there's some other questions in the chat too about thinking like how can we use these valuation techniques to further biodiversity priorities. And it is like. You know, when you're thinking about you want high high benefits 
low cost. So it was like, well, where do we get those? And so like my question sure. is around, do you put the tree in the forest or do you put it in the city? And then when you put it in the city, how do you value human health, impacts on homelessness, uh, like yeah. all the things our municipalities yeah. are are dealing with? And I see other questions about how like you actually may get a low biodiversity wetland, like Danielle's question, you know, it looks degraded, but it's actually delivering a lot of values because it's in, you know, it's close to an urban area or something. And we actually do want to conserve it because it's kind of like a stepping stone broader. So I'm just curious about um, how you can spark some of our creativity on how we think about these problems. Yeah, well, thanks. Um, I think, <laughs> well, Maybe I made things look too simple. I don't think they're that simple. So I think what you've said is, hey, wait a minute, Vic, it's not that simple. Um, but I think a couple of couple of key things. What you've described is exactly what I think is important is worry about where these things are going to be happening. I mean, that makes it tougher, but the location of the investments matters, especially when they're linked to some type of human use or human benefit, you know, when it's around uh, providing shade or improving air quality, um, closer you are to humans, the bigger the impact is going to be on the on the benefit side of those. So space matters. And I think in the past, we haven't worried enough about space. And now I think we're starting to think more carefully about that. Uh, you know, in terms of, and how do we actually use these? Again, it's unpacking what's actually being generated as, as the benefit. And maybe there are multiple. But if, but if we're conserving a wetland or avoiding a loss of a wetland, it could be that mix of things. It could have an impact on flood flood risks, and it's going to reduce flood risks if it retains uh, in that nature. It could be some recreation components. It could be some property value components, depending on where it is. Um, there could be some other beneficial aspects of it. There could be some detrimental aspects associated with it that you know some folks are thinking about. So parsing it out into what those what we call them bit jargony but we call them endpoints and what are what are the endpoints in terms of value and then thinking about what's the transmission mechanism associated with restore the wetland versus don't restore the wetland now that's all theory much harder to do in practice to try to put all those pieces together but that's that's where i'd love to see us go and maybe in a few cases there are a couple of of really important ones that if we capture those, we'll get a, a really good picture of what's happening. And I think that could that could address some of these issues. Uh, I hope that kind of answers the question, but I mean, I'm just thinking about, I even have a couple of slides in the class that I teach about a wetland here, you, you improve a wetland, here's all the different things that are generated by that. Here's all the different endpoints. Here's the things that we have to think about when we're trying to consider what the impact on value will be. No, thanks. That's really helpful framing. I think that's the key is like, how do you frame the problem? So yep. then you can figure out how to answer it. So thanks. Thanks. I'm going to segue into Danielle's question because I think it, it is, as, as Samantha said, it's kind of correlated. Um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's really looking at that spatial distribution and saying, you know, what with versus without. So with this wetland versus without the wetland, what are the outcomes? What are the outcomes in terms of you know, human uses, uh, linkages with uh, with other types of activities, and could we try to measure those and try to assess what those implications are? There, I mean, there's another question in here: is well, how do you, how do you bring equity into this and the distributional impacts? Um, I think, I mean, at this point, I think step one is just describing them. Who's going to be affected by these kinds of changes if there's a loss of a wetland? Is it uh, folks who can't, infor can't, can't afford uh, flood insurance um, because they're living in basement apartments and all of a sudden their flood risk has gone up, but poor people, uh, that's important to know as we're thinking about policy options and who would benefit from restoration and risk reduction versus just the aggregate. I think economists historically have said, well, here's the aggregate benefit. But we're increasingly saying, well, well, who is it that's actually going to be benefiting from these outcomes? Um, typically across income groups, could, but it could be regions. It could be other ways that we need to measure the diversity of impacts. Great. Thank you, Vic. 
And I think for Catherine um, and for Danielle, I hope that answers your questions. That was a nice, efficient way to move through them and to flow. I, I saw a hand up. Uh, just Glenn, we're going to jump over you for one moment because I saw Jim Fisher. You had a hand up. Would you like to ask a question? Yeah, I'm just wondering, Vic, if you're aware. I worked on this Alice thing for mm -hmm. a number of years, and and we it was always a big discussion on the EGNS, like trying to get all of all of the players and all the benefits as you're talking about. And how is anybody talking about how do we aggregate? You know, we can identify all the benefits, perhaps, say, of a wetland, and then all the you, the people who benefit and how they might contribute. Is anybody talking about being kind of that aggregator of funds for all the benefits and like put putting it all together so we uh, have a big pool of money from all the benefactors that then we can go talk to producers or whoever about said resource, like... Are we there right. yet, or are we like that? That's a utopia, right? Yeah, like, yeah. No, take a I, duck hunter's dollar and say, "Well, we like ducks because or the wetland because of the duck." So here's ten dollars yeah. and yeah. carbon and so on. Yeah, I, that's really interesting. I mean, I, I actually, I mean, that would be wonderful if we had something like that. Um, maybe we do, and I don't know about it, but that would that would be really something. I know in in other parts of the world, I mean, some of the institutions that fund various projects are also simultaneously coordinating benefits assessments and there's a there's an increased push to bring in uh natural capital measures within investment strategies in in the world bank and asian development bank and other institutions where they're saying all right we're doing these development in investments but we also want to have these measures of how we're affecting natural capital and how those should be quantified within our analyses and there are a couple of uh, really good organizations globally that are trying to inform those outcomes um it'd be cool if we had something like that where we could do that in a canadian context and have kind of a connecting organization that would bring those together right are you Thank volunteering you. delta waterfowl jim is that what you're saying <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, i'll get right on that yeah that. <laughs> thank you um so thanks jim uh we have a couple follow-up questions here from glenn friesen again um on the human impact of monitoring it's somewhat related but I uh, wondered if you want to uh, reflect on those, Vic. It would be suitable organization. Yeah, I think I, I think that's a really good question. So is it um, academic institutions, you know, sort of the notion of being arm's length and independent? Is it you know, other types of institutions? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, you, you want to have a group that's uh, you know, trustworthy, that has long term function, that uh, can report publicly and, and such. I think that's great. You know, I think in the in the context of I mean, a bit of a homer, but ABMI, Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute, does a nice job of capturing data and making them publicly available. And you know, those uh, those those things are very useful. I think across a, a wide spectrum, and you know, maybe that's one approach. Um, but I think certainly uh, public sector agencies have to be involved in this and thinking about connecting data and using data and such. And Glenn's got a follow up. Some are related to the agriculture side. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. That's, yeah. Yeah. No, I've seen a, a bit about uh, index for, for agri food performance. So I think those are, again, good initiatives to, to think about how we would collect this data, make it available, um, have it available for monitoring. I do want to go back to this notion, though, and, and I guess I'm old school. I've been doing this stuff for too long. But, you know, the Carl Walters notion about adaptive or active adaptive management. If we're doing these kinds of natural climate solutions, why don't we think about doing them as an experiment? It's actually putting them on a landscape to say, this is part of our experiment, and we've got a treatment, and we've got a control, and we want to learn some things, even though they're policy our natural capital investments or climate investments, but let's learn from them. And then we can plan the next round of them based on what we've learned from them. And so we think about that kind of strategy of how to actually use these uh, policy investments. I think that would be, that would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. Sure. Thanks, Vic. Uh, I saw there was a hand up from Cam Mack. Would you like to share, Cam? Yes, thank, thanks very much. And thanks first uh, 
Thank you very much, Vic. That was really a very thought-provoking um, seminar. I really appreciated it. Um, the the one uh, area that I wanted to probe a little bit is around the the uh, permanent versus temporary uh, actions, and and uh, um, there's no question that in terms of uh, programs, you look at they're largely built around uh, permanent kinds of act what's deemed to be permanent activities, and and the problem with this with that approach, I think, is that. Uh, if you don't like an outcome, there's a bunch of different strategies you need to use not to not to to see that outcome happen if you don't want it. And and uh, and one of them is a permanent solution, but the other that is probably more likely is a kick the can down the road mm -hmm. approach to to stuff. And and uh, you know, face between a zero action and a permanent action, uh, I I pick door number three. Which is basically, you know, if if you can get a ten year agreement or if you can get a fifteen year agreement uh, and kick the can down the road, there's there's uh, obviously it's a it's a better uh, it's a better strategy than doing nothing. And uh, so I'm, I'm just wondering, and yeah. it fits with the adaptive management uh, philosophy as well, because you like experiments to be sort of uh, have a a, a measurable endpoint uh, that's a little bit shorter. Um, uh, I'm just wondering if if there's uh, any any work that's been done on on looking at uh, sort of a kick the kick the can down the road approach and the impact of potential temporary uh, measures to achieve an overall outcome. Yeah, this is a, this is a great question. So there are two pieces to it. I think one of the concerns with the some of the temporary solutions is that you know then if there's a, a concomitant release after uh, that actually might if you, if you go back to those social cost of carbon measures it might actually make things worse because it's affecting things at a, at a time when the when the impacts are actually higher valued i think I should have included this maybe in the list of references. Uh, colleague uh, Brent Sanjan at Ohio State University has written some really interesting papers in the forestry side. Uh, Cameron, if you send me an email, uh, it'll jog my memory to send the paper. And what he's really looked at is that there are benefits of climate solutions early um, for a variety of reasons to try to get on top of those. And their argument is uh, rental of carbon now may actually be quite beneficial uh, you know, as long as you're not releasing too much of it too quickly, that could be a really important strategy. And, and as I say, they're doing this in the forestry context. So there's been lots of discussion about kind of temporary carbon sequestration from that perspective and, and the benefits. And not everybody's convinced, but I think they, they make a pretty interesting argument about why we should consider that as, you know, again, all the tools have to be on the table. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Vic. I'll send you my email. It's great. Perfect. Perfect. Well, thank you, Cam, for that question. And we are at 11 o'clock, so I think maybe we'll we'll stop there for today. I know there's there's a lot more that could be said and a lot more discussion that we could have. But I want on behalf of everyone here to say thank you so much, Vic, for that excellent presentation. And uh, we look forward to engaging further. And if there's any questions, uh, let me know. Uh, you'll see that on the PSJV's uh, YouTube channel, a very famous, well-loved YouTube channel, uh, you just go there and this this presentation has been recorded and will you can review it at your leisure. And then also Vic's, Vic's email address is, is at the start of the presentation for direct communication, or you can speak to me. Um, it was one last thing to just say on March 13th, the next presentation will be from Graham Gilchrist from Biological Carbon Canada, uh, sort of continuing the theme around carbon. And then in April, we will have one from the Smart Prosperity Institute. So thank you very much. Have a wonderful day and a round of applause, Vic, for you. Thanks, folks. That yeah, was fun. Great questions, everybody. Thanks. All right, Michael, you're trying to sneak in at the end of the question, are you? <laughs> Great. All right, we'll just wait till everyone pops off. And yeah, and a lot of familiar names on there. A few familiar faces pop up. That's great. Right. And it's quite a good turnout, too. We had 